ended an earlier lecture by noting very quickly that if there's a meaning of life for Nietzsche, it's to be found not in reason and rationality, but rather in the passions. And what I'd like to do in this lecture is to spell that thesis out in much more detail. Perhaps the first thing to say is that if you look at the Western tradition in philosophy, and this includes, I would say, a good deal of the philosophy that is going on in the English-speaking world today, philosophy is all about reason and rationality. And although philosophers are often a bit contemptuous of the undergraduate question, what is the meaning of life? Nevertheless, they would hold out that if that question has an answer, it's to be gained only through the use of reason. One can trace that certainly back to Socrates and perhaps before. Socrates was adamant about the fact that, for example, we should not yield to our emotions. That's what he says to Crito in the midst of one of the most famous early dialogues. That reason is the way to save your soul and reason is the way to find the truth. In medieval philosophy, reason was often equated with God himself. In modern philosophy, for example, in the Enlightenment, reason, now equated with science, was considered the way to answer all human problems and the way to know about the world. And in contemporary philosophy, it's often said that philosophy has been reduced to, or certainly focuses on, pure logic, reason pure and simple, and appeal to emotions is simply out of place. But the first thing to notice about rationality is that it doesn't have a single meaning. That in the history of philosophy, it takes on a number of different masks, and they don't always go together completely nicely. First, you might notice that rationality, certainly as most philosophers talk about it, refers, refers to the general class of activities such as thinking, the ability to reflect the ability to use a fairly sophisticated kind of language. And as a very general feature, one might say that rationality is to that extent a faculty which humans certainly possess, almost all of us, perhaps some higher animals possess to a lesser degree, but it's the ability to use concepts. And with concepts, the ability to understand the world in something more than simply stimulus response patterns. But then there's a much more sophisticated, but also much more narrow use of the notion of rationality. Arist uh, the, the ancient Greeks summed this up in terms of mathematics. It is said that on the walls of Plato's Academy, it said basically, if you don't know geometry, don't come in. Bertrand Russell sums up this view of rationality in the Greeks by saying rather, whimsically, the Greeks thought that we were rational because we could do sums. There's another meaning of rationality which is broader. It's a kind of instrumental reasoning to use a language that became popular at the beginning of this century. It's to think in means ends terms. It's rationality now as a kind of practical, even a kind of strategic faculty. In fact, there's a good deal of contemporary philosophy, ethics, so-called, in which one of the models is what is called game theory. And you think your way, you reason your way through the best way to achieve your goals, and in particular, the best way to achieve your goals against an, against an opponent. That's a use of the word rationality, and of course, there we're starting to get into some rather gray territory. Finally, Rationality has to do with not the way to achieve your goals or the best way of, uh, of competing with an opponent, but rationality has to do with having the right goals. And with this, we go back to the Greeks again. Aristotle, for example, never would have allowed that reason is simply, as modern thinkers have argued, a way of figuring out how to get what you want. Reason is, at least in part, wanting the right things. So there's a sense in which, if you look at just these four meanings, you already get a sense of 
quite a wide spread, from the abstractness and impracticality in one sense of pure mathematics to the, I think, obsessive strategic rationality of something like game theory and uh, trying to figure out how to beat your opponent. But there's another meaning of rationality that runs through the history of philosophy. It is perhaps most clear in Plato and in Socrates, but it continues through certainly to the 20th century. You find it, for example, in some of the European phenomenologists at the beginning of this century, and you still find it in some analytic philosophers in England and America. But basically, it's the notion that reason is the royal road to the truth, that reason doesn't just allow us to perceive, and philosophers have been in agreement since ancient times, that sometimes our experience can be misleading, but rather reason somehow bypasses all that. And in someone like Kant, for example, reason allows us to make some sort of contact with the world in itself, the world as it really is. Socrates, perhaps the luminary figure in all of this, had a concept which he shared with several of his Greek colleagues. It's the concept of nous, which is generally translated as something like intellectual intuition. But if you remember that story that both Kathy and I have now told, the myth of the cave, in which the slave who has seen only shadows emerges into the sunlight and then returns to tell his fellows what he has seen. That image of seeing reality through the shadows of everyday experience, that is noose. It is reason as a, as a special facility to directly see the truth, even if as mortals we can only get a glimpse of it now and then. Socrates takes this notion of reason together with some of the other notions of reason, reason as thinking, reason as reflecting, reason as the skillful use of language, and turns it into a method. It's part of what he means by dialectic. But the basic idea is that for Socrates, this kind of reasoning process, which as I emphasized is for him very much a social process, this is the way to gain the truth. And again, he excludes the emotions, the passions. He excludes public opinion. And in Nietzsche's words, what Socrates does is he turns reason into a tyrant so that it becomes the only mode of philosophical thinking. And of course, this is something which is picked up and carried through the 20th century. In the Enlightenment, which is roughly the 17th through 19th centuries, it spread through Europe from uh, west to east, it was in England first, then it got to France, then it hit Germany fairly late and with a mixed reception. It finally reached Russia about the beginning of this century and resulted in a revolution there, as it had in France earlier. Of course, it reached America right from its inception in the 18th century. But the Enlightenment, as it's usually characterized, it is basically a kind of faith. And of course, some of its critics would say, it really is a religious faith, but in any case, it's a faith. It's faith in reason. Reason as science will solve our problems. Reason as science will allow us to gain knowledge of the world. Reason as practical knowledge will allow us to design the right kinds of societies, to raise people the right way, to improve our educational institutions or what some conservative critics today would call social engineering. That's very much an enlightenment concept. And the basic idea is that it is proceeding by way of reason. This isn't to say that some of the enlightenment philosophers didn't put a fairly heavy emphasis on what they called sentiment, in particular the sentiment of sympathy and the kind of sentiments that go into community feeling and living together. But they were by no means advocates of or apologists for what I would call the passions, those very strong, almost maniacal feelings that Nietzsche characterized as the Dionysian. So in a way, there's a sense in which the Enlightenment is very much opposed to Nietzsche, 
that the Apollonian, in its strict form, from Socrates through the Enlightenment, is really the contrast to the Dionysian. It also is opposed to a certain kind of faith. Now, there's an interesting argument that goes on here between, for example, those who, who think of faith as a kind of passionate commitment, and most notably, I think, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish existentialist and religious thinker, and those who actually take faith and even move it into the rationalist camp. For example, Kant defines a notion of faith in which faith isn't mere belief, much less believing what all the evidence says the other way, but the contrary. Faith is a mode of reason. Faith is a kind of postulate of our moral attitudes, and if you accept morality as a rational person must, then you must also accept, almost by sheer logic, the necessity of religious faith too. But what's very interesting there is that the Enlightenment, of which Kant is the primary German representative, the Enlightenment is so adamant about the exclusivity of reason that even religion has to be brought into the umbrella of reason and not left in the obscure, murky realm of emotion. One of the pretensions of reason, universal, and that's of course one of the things that Kant finds most important about it. Because when you reason, you reason not just for yourself. And when you reason, you are not simply reflecting the beliefs or even the language of your particular culture. When you reason, you are reasoning not only for all of humanity, but Kant expands it even further so that it's you reason for all rational creatures. And that, of course, would include God, as well as angels and any other rational beings that might exist in the universe apart from human beings. What follows from this is that God is a rational being, and that equation that comes out of the Middle Ages of God and reason starts to make perfectly good sense. God commands what he does. God has created what he has created, not because he loved the world, so much as because he reasoned that this is the right thing to do for God. The Enlightenment had a problematic reception in Germany because although Kant was a very enthusiastic advocate, there's a sense, a funny sense, in which Kant is more an English or a French philosopher than a German one. Because the pro predominant mode in, of thought in Germany was what we now call Romanticism. Now, Romanticism also has a very interesting history. Part of the interest is that it's almost coincidental with Enlightenment. And so it, too, begins in England and moves through France to Germany. But in Germany, it's the dominant mode of thought. Now, Romanticism, although the concept itself is very modern, can also be traced back to ancient times. One might say, for example, that the Dionysian cults were romantic in a sense, and certainly all of those authors say St. Augustine, who put their emphasis on faith, and faith not in a necessarily rational sense, could also be considered proto-romantics. The dominant romantic of modern times, the one who in many ways set the entire movement in motion, was the Swiss-French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who in particular emphasized the importance of the sentiments, and the implication, at least, of the emotions, as opposed to pure reason. Along with him, interestingly enough, David Hume in Scotland and his best friend Adam Smith also defended the sentiments and minimized the importance of reason in our moral sensibilities. But in Germany, Romanticism took on a stark contrast with the Enlightenment. Hume, for example, or Rousseau. Both would have considered themselves Enlightenment philosophers. But in Germany, the Enlightenment was generally considered vulgar, and it was associated with, at that time, the alien cultures of England and France. Hegel, for example, treats the Enlightenment very dismissively in his books, although one could argue that Hegel 
was very much the heir of the Enlightenment as a student of Kant. Schopenhauer could very nicely be called a romantic philosopher, and he was certainly treated that way by a good many of the young poets and literary people in Germany, because he quite directly confronted the Enlightenment, the idea that reason will make life better for us, and rejected it. In brief, the idea is that the Romantics, as opposed to the Enlightenment thinkers, didn't put their faith in reason, but put it somewhere else. And that somewhere else, I think, can best be described as the passions. Now, in Schopenhauer, this is perhaps the most distinct. Because in Schopenhauer, if I can translate what we've been talking about as the will and experience in the will in us, and generalize that, what one might say is that what Schopenhauer says is what's real or our contact with what's really real are our passions. And sexual passion is one example of that. But there's a sense in which a great many of our passions are exemplary of what the world is really about. And what Nietzsche wants to say is that it's in your passions, not in what you think and calculate, not in what's necessarily rational. That's where you find yourself, that's where you find meaning, and in particular, that's where you find the meaning of the world. As Kathy said in a prior lecture, for Nietzsche, seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon is not, as it is for Schopenhauer, a way of withdrawing from it, but rather, it's a way of engaging with it. And so for Nietzsche, the idea is that aesthetics is extremely important, as it was for Schopenhauer. But aesthetics is important in a way for exactly the opposite reason. Because to see things as beautiful, to see yourself as beautiful, to live your life to make it beautiful, that's all a way of engaging with the world. It's a way of putting yourself into the flow of life as opposed to removing your one, yourself one step from it. With that in mind, one has to understand that Nietzsche is doing something very shocking in the history of philosophy. Now, it's the first time that it's ever been done. In fact, he has some German predecessors. But as opposed to this very strong emphasis that the Enlightenment endorsed on reason as the sole road to truth, Nietzsche accepts a very different picture. It's one that's hinted at by Kant at the beginning of one of his works, where he talks about God creating us like the animals, with instincts and so on, but he also gave us something more, which is what makes us distinctively human, and that is reason. But of course, then Kant goes on to talk only about reason. What Nietzsche does, by contrast, is he emphasizes the extent to which reason, in fact, is kind of superfluous. Kant says, if the purpose of life was to be happy, God would have put in us simple instinct. Because after all, most animals live fairly good lives, and they do it not by thinking their way through it, not by appreciating what life is all about, but just by following their instincts. And to tell you the truth, if people just followed their instincts, there would probably be fewer wars, fewer conflicts. We would get along much better because we would have much less sophisticated desires. The notion of private property, for example, would come into question. But of course, that's not the way we are. What Nietzsche wants to say is that if we're going to talk about trusting our instincts at all, we should take that very seriously. And so one of the moves that Nietzsche makes, again, might be thought of as a shift from philosophy in the abstract, rather ethereal, conceptual sense, to the nitty-gritty of biology. It's another example of his naturalism, another example of his this-worldliness. It's another example of how much he is very close to Darwin, although he has a great deal to say against Darwin as well. And that is, we are animals. We are motivated primarily by drives, by instincts, by an inborn capacity. Nietzsche would not have known about genetics at this point. But basically, it's very clear that what we are as a species, what we are as individuals, is something that is very much natural, biological, part of our makeup. And so, instead of those philosophers who want to say 
The meaning of life is to be found in the higher reaches of reason. Nietzsche wants to say the meaning of life is to be found in life itself and in the instincts that we find in ourselves, not uniquely as human beings, but in conjunction with the rest of the animals. The idea that it's instinct and drive that moves us and gives us meaning is another one of those very important links to Sigmund Freud, who will be writing only a decade later. Freud, of course, talks about the unconscious, and in particular, he also uses a great deal of drive language. And the idea is that the things that really move us, the things that determine our lives, are not things that we are fully conscious of, and given the nature of many of those urges and, des and desires, uh, as Freud describes them, it's a good thing we're not conscious of them, and in fact it's only when they lead us into serious trouble that it's a good thing to become fully conscious of them. There's always this sort of dual role of Freud's philosophy, if I can call it that. On the one hand, it's very important to become conscious of what's going on in the unconscious in order to control it, in order to move beyond it. At the same time, there's a sense in which we can't do that, and the forces of repression are so necessary for civilization that there's a sense in which understanding it not only doesn't do any good, but to the contrary, just makes us more unhappy. With Nietzsche, consciousness is itself dispensable. In one of the most striking passages in gay science, in fact, I think it's just about the longest single passage in the gay science, Nietzsche talks about consciousness and ask the question, one that Freud actually doesn't ask, where it comes from. Very important question. And Nietzsche has a theory. Consciousness is a faculty which has developed in us because of the necessity of communication. Now, we often think, and certainly since Descartes in the 17th century, it's a central part of philosophy, that each of us has a mind and that mind is, almost by definition, conscious and self-conscious as well. And in the mind, we find thoughts as well as feelings. And then we communicate those, with some trouble perhaps, through language to other people. Nietzsche has the opposite view. Consciousness is actually created in our interaction, in our communication with others. But also, insofar as Nietzsche is defending a view of human existence, not as a herd existence, or less unflatteringly, not as a social existence necessarily, but he's defending a kind of ferocious individualism that we'll talk about later. One might say that insofar as one can live solitudinously, consciousness in a way becomes superfluous. But the truth is, if we follow our instincts, and instinct here, by the way, is not simply the primitive bird-like instinct to build a nest, and not simply the primitive dog-like instinct to uh, attack a male rival, but rather very sophisticated notions of instincts. For example, there are aesthetic instincts, and Nietzsche thinks that this is something very basic, uh, leaving aside the question of to what extent these might be culturally derived or genetically derived. What's clear for Nietzsche? is that we have all sorts of instincts which, in fact, are very sophisticated and very cultured, and most important, they're very individual. As we'll see, Nietzsche's going to talk about the virtues, Nietzsche's going to talk about the emotions, Nietzsche's going to talk about the grand passions, in such a way that they are very distinctively each our own. It's, in a way, the opposite of Schopenhauer, where these things really are what hold us together as a larger unity. And even it's opposed to one sense of the Dionysian, at least the Dionysian writ large, where passion is something that holds us all together. That's true insofar as we're talking about something like a Dionysian orgy. But the truth is that for the purposes that Nietzsche wants in philosophy and in aesthetics, what's important is that each of us has his or her own instincts. And to even give them a name, for example, to call it territorial imperative, or to call it the creative spirit, 
is already a sense to make it sound more common than it is. So Nietzsche's view on consciousness here is something very complicated and something which, unfortunately, he doesn't work out in a great deal of detail. But the simple message is that thinking can even be a disease. Thinking can be dangerous, and not dangerous in a good sense. It's dangerous in the sense that it shuts us down. It inhibits us. It blinds us to our own particularities, our own uniqueness, our own creativity. He says, as do Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky about the same time, that quite the contrary of consciousness being the high point, the pinnacle of human facilities, consciousness is dangerous. But as so often with Nietzsche, what he attacks, he also brings back by a back route. Because consciousness is a very important stage in our evolution. He says that whenever a faculty is new, it is something which is so far untried, something in which we're unskilled, something that we will abuse, and consequently something that is dangerous for survival. But as it matures, as we get better at it, then, of course, consciousness can play a much more positive role. And one can look at Nietzsche's own thought and writing as exemplary here. He's one of the masters of language, German language in particular, but I'd say, insofar as you can make these comparisons, he's one of the masters of language in the human history. But the idea here is that language is now still kind of finding its feet. That's why Nietzsche is so experimental with it. How does language capture the truth? How does language capture human nature? How does language, in particular, capture what for each of us is the meaning of life? Now, this makes Nietzsche very much in line with the Romantics, but it's important to sort of point out that just as Nietzsche often attacks figures who would seem to be fairly close to him, Socrates being the most obvious example, he also attacks movements that would seem to be very much his own. But he says of Romanticism in one of his more sarcastic comments that Romanticism muddies the waters to make them look deep. And he is very critical of many of the Romantic poets and philosophers of his time for, in fact, trying to sound profound when, in fact, they're really just uttering platitudes. Or what they're doing is making kind of cosmic statements and, of course, Schopenhauer falls into this category. Some sense of the world sweeping through us and so on. And one can kind of envision this in two different ways. If you know the paintings of Caspar Friedrich, um, typically we'll have a lone individual in some majestic scene in which the landscape is sort of covered by fog and there are mountains in the background and all sorts of interesting shadows. And you get the sense of the individual kind of lost in nature, or a different kind of depiction. Uh, Wagner's overtures. Uh, my favorite is the overture to the Flying Dutchman, in which you get this musical rendition in which you really feel yourself sort of swirling through space and time. But ultimately, Nietzsche wants to say, that's not the right view either. Romanticism, as Goethe had put it before him, Romanticism has a very strong tendency to be sickly. That in fact, it's a kind of pretended passion. That instead of expressing the passions, the instincts, the drives that are really within us, and very powerful at that, what Romanticism does is manufactures them. Makes them look as if they are grand passions when in fact, they're really just poetic aspirations, or perhaps just the desire to sort of fit in with the new Romantic crowd, in other words, the same kind of criticism he levels at Christianity, the same kind of criticism he levels at the moral majority, that basically this presents itself as something cosmic and essentially important, but in fact, it's a kind of mask, it's a kind of act. Although I've been using the distinction between reason and passion and talking as if reason and passion are opposed in the Enlightenment, in Romanticism, and so on, Nietzsche's view, I think, is in fact much more interesting and much more sophisticated. The truth is, these are not distinct at all. He writes in one place, as if every passion doesn't contain its quantum of reason. And elsewhere he suggests that reason is nothing but the confluence of the passions. 
So the picture here is that when we're talking about the human spirit, what we're really talking about is something that is intrinsically passionate and intrinsically rational. In other words, the combination of the Apollonian and the Dionysian.